So far we have been discussing about Turing machines and all the Turing machines that we have discussed so far were deterministic in nature. Now we already know what is the meaning of determinism and non-determinism as we have already seen the deterministic as well as the non-deterministic properties for other machines like finite state machines and push-down automata. Now as far as Turing machines were concerned we were only discussing about deterministic Turing machines but now in this lecture we will be seeing about non-determinism in Turing machines and we will see what does a non-deterministic Turing machine look like and we will also see if the non-deterministic Turing machines will provide us any additional power as compared to deterministic Turing machines. Now if you remember the formal definition that we studied about Turing machines, this was the formal definitions that we had and the only difference that will be there in non-deterministic Turing machines will be in this transition function. As for deterministic Turing machines, the transition function is given like this. So it says that a particular state on getting a particular input will go to another state writing some symbols on the tape and moving either to the right or to the left. So what we can notice over here is that a particular state on getting a particular input will go to only one state. So this is what is going to be different in the non-deterministic Turing machine. So let's see how it is. So here is a transition function for the non-deterministic Turing machine. So if you look at this, you can see that the only difference is that I have written a P over here. So P stands for power set and the rest of the things are the same. So this means that a state on getting a particular input can go not only to one state but it can go to many states. So instead of one state we have written the power set of these combinations that is possible. So let's take an example and see how this actually works. So this is an example of a deterministic Turing machine. This is the transition diagram for it. So here we have two states Q and S and it says that State Q on getting a particular input symbol B will write C onto the tape and will move to the right and it will go to state S. So we see here that on getting a particular input symbol it will go to only one state. So for this combination it will only go to the state S and it will not go to any other state. But now in case of non-deterministic Turing machines let us see what is the difference. So here is an example of a non-deterministic Turing machine. So this is the transition diagram. We have states Q, T, P and S. And here we see that state Q on getting a particular input symbol B, it can either go to state T by writing C to the tape and moving to the right or it can go to state P by writing A to the tape and moving to the left or it can go to state S by writing C to the tape and moving to the left. So we see that on getting a particular input symbol, it can have more than one moves. So this is the property of non-determinism. Now we will see how does the configuration of a deterministic Turing machine differ from the configuration of a non-deterministic Turing machine. So before that, we need to first understand the term configuration. Let's understand what is configuration and then let's see how does it differ. So configuration is defined as a way to represent the entire state of a Turing machine at a moment during computation. So it is a string which captures the current state, the current position of the head and the entire tape contents. So what we mean by this is that let's say that we have a Turing machine's tape as given like this for example and let's say that these are the contents of the tape and the tape head is pointing over here and we are in some state right now. So at the present moment we want to know what is the status of our Turing machine. We want to know in which state it is and we want to know what is the current position of the head and we want to know what are the entire tape contents. So we need a string which can represent all these things. So the configuration of this particular moment of this Turing machine can be represented as follows. So here I have a string which represents the configuration of this Turing machine. So here I have A B A Q B B A A. So this one A B A B B A A. These are the contents of the tape and this Q represents the current state at which we are presently in. And then we see that the tape head it points at the symbol B. So we are at state Q and this arrow over here 
it is pointing to B. So it says that we are in state Q and we are looking at the symbol B in the tape. So this string can tell us the exact status of our Turing machine at any particular moment. Now let us take some examples of this configuration and let us see how it differs in deterministic as well as in non-deterministic Turing machines. So here we have an example of a deterministic Turing machine with three states Q, S and P and these are the transitions that it has. State Q on getting input A will write X to the tape and move to the right and if the state Q gets input B then it will write Z to the tape and move to the left and if the state S gets B input then it will write Y to the tape and move to the right and then this is just one snip of the Turing machine's diagram that I have shown here so it may be continuing to other states as it proceeds. Now let us see the computation history of this Turing machine using the configuration that we have just learned before. So here is a computation history. So here this represents the configuration of the first state. We are in this state and let's say that the tape symbols are C, C, A, B, B, C which is not mentioned anywhere here but we are just assuming that this is the tape symbols. So C, C and then we are at state Q. This state Q is represented by this Q over here and we are looking at the input A. We are looking at the input A in the tape. So this shows the configuration of this first state over here. And then what happens in state Q, if you get this input A, then we should replace it A with X and move to the right. So that is what happened in the next step over here. C, C and this A is now replaced with an X and then we are now in state S. We have moved to state S and in state S, we are looking at the input symbol B now. So that is why this arrow points to B. In state S, we are looking at the symbol B and then this B and C are the same as before. Now we are in state S and in state S what happens is that if you see a B, then you replace that B with Y and move to the right. So that is what we see here. We are in state S and if you see a B, then we have to replace that B with a Y. So that is what happened over here. We have CCX, CCX and this B is replaced with Y, this one. And then it moves to the right and we are in state P right now. We are in state P and then we are looking at the input symbol B and this C is as it is. So this is a computation history shown using the configurations of this deterministic Turing machine. So here the path we took was this one, Q to S, S to P. And if we had taken this path, it would have been different. That means if we got input B instead of A in the state Q, then it would have been different. So we assume that this is what we got and this is an example of the computational history. Now let us see for non-determinism what will happen in this same kind of case. So with non-determinism, at each moment in the computation, there can be more than one successor configuration. So we see that in deterministic Turing machines, the configuration, it is a linear chain because for every individual input, there will be only one move to a, another state. So that is why we have a linear chain like this. But in case of non-determinism, at each moment of computation, there can be more than one successor configurations because in a particular state on getting a particular input, we can go to more than one states as I have shown before. Now let's take an example and see this. So here we have an example of a non-deterministic Turing machine with its transition diagram given here. So here we have states Q, P, R, S, T and U. So here we see that state Q on getting input A, it can either write X to the tape and move to the right or on getting input A, it can also write Y to the tape and move to the left. So we see that on a particular input symbol, it can have two different kind of moves and then state P has only one move and even in state S, it has two moves on this particular symbol C. Now let us see the computational history of this non-deterministic Turing machine using the configurations. So here is a computation history for this particular non-deterministic Turing machine. So we start with this one. So we are in state Q in the beginning and here we assume our tape to be C, C, A, B, B, C again and here we are in state Q looking at the input symbol A. We are in state Q looking at the input symbol A. Now when we look at the input symbol A, it can either write X to the tape and move to the right 
or right Y to the tape and move to the left. So we have two different kind of moves for this particular input symbol A. So because of that we see that the computation history is not a linear chain anymore but it is a tree in case of the non-deterministic Turing machine. So it can either replace the A with a X. So it can replace A with X. So here it has replaced A with X and it moves to state P. Moves to state P and then we are looking at the input symbol B now. So this is one possibility. Another possibility is that the A will be replaced by Y and it moves to the left. So this A is replaced by Y and now it moves to the left and we are in state S. So we are in state S moving to the left looking at input symbol C now. Now let us complete this part first. We are, if we are in state P looking at the input symbol B then B will be replaced by Y moving to the right. We are in state P looking at B so this B will be replaced by Y and we move to the right and we are in state R after doing that. So C C X and this B is replaced by Y and we are in state R looking at this B now and C over here. So this part is complete. Now let's see this part of the tree. So if we are in state S and looking at input symbol C there are again two possibilities. One is to move to state T or to state U. So let's see if we move to state T what happens. We have to replace C with Z and move to the left. So here this C is replaced with Z and we move to the left. We are in state T looking at C again. And in this possibility we replace C with W and move to the right. So this C is replaced with W and we move to the right. And we are in state U. So we are in state U looking at Y. So this is the computational history for the non-deterministic Turing machine. So we see that here it is not a linear chain anymore but it is a tree because for even one single input there are many possibilities. So this is how the computation history for non-deterministic Turing machine look like. So with this we can understand the way non-deterministic Turing machines actually works. Now the next thing that we need to know is that what are the outcomes of a non-deterministic Turing machine's computation? So we already know that Turing machines they generally have three outcomes. One is to accept, one is to reject and another one is loop. So let's see how does the accept, the reject and the loop will be defined in case of non-deterministic Turing machine. So the first outcome of a non-deterministic Turing machine could be accept. Now how do we define accept? If any branch of the computation accepts, then the non-deterministic Turing machine will accept. So if you remember when we were designing Turing machines, there used to be a accept state which we used to show. But in the examples that we just took, we did not show any accept states. But in a complete Turing machine, there used to be an accept state. So if any of the computational branch leads to the accept state, then we can say that that Turing machine will accept the particular language that was fed into it. Now the next outcome that we can have is a reject. So again when we discuss about Turing machines we have seen that there used to be a reject state in a complete Turing machine and sometimes we don't show the reject state so that does not mean that there is no reject that just means that if it does not go to an accept then it rejects. So let's see how we can define rejects in case of a non-deterministic Turing machine. If all branches of the computation hold and reject, that is no branches accept but all the computations hold, then the non-deterministic Turing machine rejects. So we know that there is a concept of looping. So if our Turing machine does not enter a loop and also it does not reach an accept state, then we can say that that Turing machine will reject or it will reject the string that was provided into that Turing machine. But make sure that in reject the computation has to hold. It should not go into a loop but it should come to a hold. Now the last outcome that we can have is a loop. So we already know what is looping. Computation continues but except is never encountered. Some branches in the computational history are infinite. So sometimes some of the computations does not reach an accept state but it continues computing without ending. So it goes into a loop. So that is another outcome that we can have in a non-deterministic Turing machine. So the outcomes that we have 
are the same in case of deterministic and non-deterministic Turing machines, but the way we define them may be a little different. These are the outcomes that we can have in a non-deterministic Turing machines computation. So with that, I hope you have understood the way a non-deterministic Turing machine works and also how it is different as compared to a deterministic Turing machine. So in the next lecture, we will try to see if this non-determinism in Turing machines will provide us any additional power as compared to the deterministic Turing machines or if they are the same. So we will see that in the next lecture. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.